We're very happy to have uh, these two great teams here. I'm just going to do quick intro so you know who everyone is, and we're going to just dive right in. I know you have a ton of questions on how to make awesome work like this, right? Um, so uh, from that far end, we'll just go this way. Brian Boyer uh, is the visuals editor at NPR. Uh, before NPR, he interned at ProPublica and founded the news applications team at the Ch uh, Chicago Tribune. He was one of the first two programmers to receive a Knight-funded scholarship to study journalism at Medill, which is another school. Um, he is learning to use uh, a camera. <laughs> he loves his job. All right. Uh, next to Brian is Alex Blumberg. Alex is the CEO of Gimlet Media, a new podcast network. He was a producer for This American Life and co-founded and hosted Planet Money. He has previously won a DuPont for This American uh, Life's episode, The Giant Pool of Money. Uh, to his right is Katrina Barlow. Katrina is currently the lead producer at the Seattle Times where she manages and designs digital projects and oversees the homepage team. Her duties, among many, include uh, deciding what news stories are most important, writing lots of headlines, planning and strategizing, digital coverage of upcoming news events and pushing the envelope in di innovative design at the Times. And whenever she can find the time, she writes for the food and dining section. And right to my left here, uh, besides being a buddy of mine, uh, Danny Kowalski is the photo and video editor at the Seattle Times. He was part of the team awarded the 2010 Pulitzer Prize for breaking news reporting. So you have a Pulitzer and a DuPont? Yeah, that's like a journal. <laughs> that's a journalism <laughs> egot. Okay, um, uh, for coverage of police of uh, police slaying and the ensuing manhunt, it was the first time that the online coverage was specifically mentioned in a Pulitzer citation. His team just won a Dupont for the piece you saw, Sea Change, uh, the Pacific's perilous turn, uh, a Seattle, Seattle Times environmental report. Um, so we're glad to have this team here. So I'm going to jump right in. Both of these projects are are uh, big and amazing on a lot of levels, but uh, they're also very human. And, and, and you know, you talk about globalization in the NPR piece, you talk about the environment, but it was very human. So I just wanna start off with anyone who wants to jump in. How did you guys come at the story and how did you come up with the pr approach to the story? It's a big question, so you can tackle it any way you want. Um. Uh, I'll dive in. Uh, you started. Uh, start. <laughs> yeah. I'll kick us off. <laughs> uh, so, um, well, I, I, I think coming out of a radio background, that's, you, you, that's sort of like the default way you have to do it because um, a radio story, you have, you're, you're constrained by one very simple rule. The person you point the microphone, the thing you point the microphone at has to be able to talk to you. <laughs> and so, uh, if you're trying to tell a story that, about a system or the environment or something big, you still have to find the people inside of it. So it's sort of, it's a second nature thing, I think, with, with radio. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what we were trying to sort of like, those are the kinds of stories that I like, is, is um, you know, stories where you're talking about a system, but, you're, but systems are made up of people. And like, the people who make up the system often have the, the best insights about that system. Um, and they're often the people that are least heard, you know, so you hear a lot about globalization, but you don't really often hear from the people who are actually making the shirts in the factory. Um, and that's in sort of telling their story. And so that's what we were trying to do. We wanted to just talk to the people inside the system. We wanted to tell the story of our clothes the way the vast majority of our clothes are actually made. Because behind all of our clothes, behind this shirt, there is an entire world. Once you see that world, you realize there's nothing ordinary about a simple t-shirt. Our t-shirts started here, or near here anyway, on a cotton farm in the Mississippi Delta. America, it turns out, exports more cotton than any other country in the world. For about a century, America maintained its cotton dominance by using slave labor. Today, it does so using technology. It's a place halfway around the world, a factory in Indonesia called Indorama. And so we packed our bags and we went. Anil Tiberwal, he's the chief sales guy at Indorama. 
and he met us at the factory gate. So Anil takes us into the plant, the plant itself. It's big as a football field, and there is hardly a worker in sight. These are beautiful machines. They are, like, immaculate. And very expensive. Very expensive, he says. And here's what all those machines do. The cotton gets sucked into sort of a long, thick rope. It's like an infinite ponytail. And this ponytail dips and swirls above our heads. And I reach out and grab a little bit of it. it feels like cotton candy. It's so light. And if you, if you touch it, it almost falls apart. It's so fragile. Four million people in Bangladesh work in the garment industry. It's double the number from a decade ago. Which raises a question. What has driven four million people to work long hours in these factories for some of the lowest wages in the world? To answer that question, we went back with Jasmine to the village where she grew up. A lot of garment workers come from villages like Jasmine's, where people worry about getting enough food to eat and sometimes don't, and where girls are seen as an economic burden. The solution? Find a husband with the means to support your daughter. But finding a good husband costs money, a dowry. And Jasmine's family, her older sister's dowry, sent the family into debt. We've been stymied, though, when we try to do the environment. Like, it's really hard, but certainly for... I, I am curious about how you guys did it. Well, that's definitely... Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for having us. It's, it's really humbling to be here. Um, thanks for staying after the pizza to listen to it. <laughs> um, but that, that was definitely the intention with our video piece, uh, why we, you know, in deciding how we put out all the different uh, portions of the story, why the video is up on top. Um, our hope and our intention was to help the audience gain an emotional connection to what's really sort of a, um, I mean, it's a story of atoms. It's a, it's a, it's a science story but it affects people. And so the hope and the intention with video is to use video's strength to help you create an emotional connection, to help you care, to help you relate, and then to allow you to dive deeper to the other elements of the story uh, throughout the page and throughout the project. And to add to Danny, one of the things that I like the most about this project is the reporter Craig Welch had been covering oysters and the acidifying waters of the Puget Sound region, which is, you know, the areas just off the coast of Washington state. So for us, it was a backyard story. And he kept sort of extending outwards and realizing that the story of ocean acidification across the globe was not getting covered by anyone. I mean, it was just not a topic that someone had looked at in the way that he wanted to look at it. So he started traveling, and when he was in Papua New Guinea talking to one of the lead biologists on a really cutting edge ocean acidification report, she was saying that the epicenter of the problem was in Washington State and Oregon, which is just, you know, a global story that for us started locally and expanded dramatically outwards. A few years ago, Washington's oyster industry nearly collapsed, exposing a haunting truth about the world's oceans. Kathleen's family business nearly dissolved beneath her feet. The seawater that once nourished their oysters, both on the mudflats and in hatcheries where they buy their oyster larvae, instead had started to kill them. The reason? Rising CO2 emissions from our cars and power plants is changing the chemistry of the sea. This phenomenon, known as ocean acidification, was always expected to hit shelled creatures hard, but that wasn't supposed to happen until late in the century. Instead, it's happening now. In 2008, when we didn't get anything from the hatcheries, they were completely shut down for weeks at a time, and that was huge for us. Our farm struggled for the first few years, and so that really put our farm on the spot, and my parents on the spot to be able to figure out what they were going to do to be able to have a healthy business for me, for future generations, my kids. Knowing the problem would only get worse, 
Kathleen's parents took a radical step. They built their own hatchery in Hawaii, which draws water from underground rather than from the sea. They became, in a sense, ocean acidification's first refugees. To better predict how acidification will affect other marine creatures, scientists in Papua New Guinea, on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, are studying underwater vents that release carbon dioxide bubbles below coral reefs. The bubbles create pockets of water where the chemistry mirrors ocean acidification. So it really presents a natural laboratory to study the effects of ocean acidification on coral reefs like nowhere else in the world. Coral reefs are more than just beautiful. They are incredibly important, providing homes and food for thousands of creatures. A quarter of the world's fish rely on corals at some point during their lives. But CO2 from the bubble sites is helping turf-like algae, seagrass, and slime crowd out the reefs, making life extremely difficult for corals and the creatures that live there. But it's not just where fish live that is at risk. Working mostly with clownfish, researchers figured out that carbon dioxide can change a fish's brain, scrambling its hearing, its sight, and its sense of smell, even the likelihood it will turn left or right. Right. That leads these CO2-altered fish to die more often than right. fish in normal water. The problem isn't unique to the tropics. Back across the Pacific Ocean, researchers in the Northwest are finding similar effects on the most important fish in America, pollock, which makes up half the nation's catch of fish. So Brian, you're, you, so I've been listening to Alex's voice for years. You know, I get, I get that medium, I get the radio, but NPR is known for that, and you're the visuals editor. So can you talk a little bit about that title and how it related to this project and how you came together? Yeah, it's, um, this project was actually sort of the beginning of a new thing for us. We didn't know when we were starting it. The, um, you know, we, were, we had a group called the News Applications Team. We had a group called the Multimedia Team. And we ended up, we realized we needed to work really closely together on this piece. So this was, this, this whole thing was a very, was weirdly deeply collaborative. Like that we were working so closely with Alex and his crew. And then we basically had like a little war room where we got the photo people and the video people and the designers and the programmers all in one space. And, um, you know, it's the, the, the thing that sort of our, our and that, that, that team eventually became the visuals team. The, and and our, on our sort of, uh, the, the unofficial team t-shirt, the t-shirt that I haven't made yet because I'm cheap, um, you know, would say, you know, our, our new motto, our motto of late is, is we make people care. Right? And so kind of like what you were talking about, with, uh, about, about empathy, right? There's sort of, there's the person in the story and then there's the audience. And our, and our team takes a very, a very audience-centered approach to how we design things and how we do storytelling. So instead of, you know, I, I feel like we frequently, you know, like as, as a former engineer, engineers like want to build big engineering things and designers want to design really beautiful things and journalists always have their perfect story they want to tell, right? And we all have to be stopped. <laughs> right, like the 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 you know, and, and so what we try when we approach every piece, including this one, is we we um, we you know we, we the first question we ask, we sort of try to reset everyone's ideas about what the story is, and step back and say, who's our audience? Like, who are the people that actually care about this thing? And then, what questions do they have? What do they need to know? What what don't they know? What do they you know what the, you know the que you know, questions we talked about? You know, it's like, uh, where does my T-shirt come from? Who are these people? Um, how does this whole thing work? I've heard of globalization, but you know. Um, I think I think we decided our audience was everybody who's ever worn a T-shirt. Everybody, yeah, yeah, which is an unfortunately broad audience <laughs> in terms of a product design exercise. Right. Um, but but that I feel like that when we always when we start with our audience and then we start thinking about their questions or needs and then we start thinking about what we make, then you end up with very often end up with very different ideas than the ideas you had at the beginning when you just were kind of coming up with a clever thing to do. So, let me follow up on that, and I want to talk about your process too. So, you called it a war room. I've been in those war rooms because wars go on in those rooms. Yeah, so, yeah it smells like feet. Yeah, yeah. It, how can you can you talk specifically in the beginning? Because because it was both uh, a radio story and then also an online presentation. So, how did you guys mitigate that? How did you stop all the people you had to stop to come together? Can you give us a little bit of that background? I mean, I, I, I would be really interested. It was, it was a, so this was a long project in the making, too. So this goes back, like, this was an idea at Planet Money to do this t-shirt project for, like, years. And then we were, and then it came out of this idea that we were gonna, like, and then we were gonna do this, the t-shirt, we were gonna sell the t-shirt, and then it was gonna tell its own story. And that's all we knew. Like, it, it, this was the radio team, sort of like, it'll be something online. 
you know, that's all, that's our, so, so, so fortunately, <laughs> but in between the time that we had that idea and we actually ex were ready to execute the idea, Brian had come aboard and was like, had some expertise on like, was, ac was that maybe the one person in the world who could actually execute on sort of what, what, what we were, thought we were gonna try to do. Um, but when it came time to sort of design the, the website, there was a bunch of different processes that we had to worry about. We had to worry about getting the radio stories done and the podcast done. We had to worry about getting the right visual assets to use in the, in the thing. And then we had to worry about like, what is this thing gonna look like? What is the, what is the actual entity gonna be? Is it gonna be a page within the NPR homepage? Is it gonna be a standalone page? Is it gonna be something else? Like, is it gonna be an app on your, like we were just sort of, we didn't know. And so there was like a programming thing, a visual thing and an audio thing that we all had to do. And the, I'd done the TV show at This American Life, so I had some ideas of like, I was adamant from the beginning that the, that the video and the audio were gonna be co-reported, but by different people. So like when we, we sent people to the factory in, in, in Bangladesh, we sent radio people there, and we sent uh, video people there, because the way you have to tell those stories is so different. And like the worst thing that I think journalists do is, or like sort of media organizations do is like say, well, we'll just have the, the audio reporter carry the camera or whatever. They're like two totally different mediums and you need to like treat them differently. So that was the thing. And then we basically, and then I don't know, you take it from there. What did we do? Well, God, I mean, we definitely did this sort of user-centered design exercise, but to, to, so to answer the, to, to answer the question about mitigating war, maybe. Um, right. the, the thing I think we, we, we try to do over and over again is, is make so there are a lot of ways to like make a decision. There are a lot of ways to solve an argument, right? There are definitely moments when you and I disagreed on something or moments that any member of the team disagreed with someone else. They're like, no, it really should work like this. Like the button should be blue. No, the button should be fucking red, right? And, and, and there's like, there, there are ways to solve that, right? You can vote, right? You can have democracy, right? And that's terrible. And you can, you can have uh, ego. Ego can win, right? The person who's the loudest can, can make the decision because they're the least willing to give up. Um, it can be handled by, um, by fiat, right? The boss can be like, no, blue, right? Um, but I think what, what we were able to do several times in this project was make a decision with evidence, right? So, and sometimes that was, you know, we would build a prototype of um, how the website should work and we would put it in front of people, right? And then we would see and they would try using it and they would fail at using it and then we knew we were wrong, right? Um, I mean, there was a, there was a, in the, there was a specific argument, and you saw in the video, there was when that, that, um, that drone shot of the cotton field and it said Mississippi across the, t across the front. Um, we, we had a lot of arguments about if it should say Mississippi, on the, if we should put that type on the video. And uh, at the end of the day, like, we, we argued about it, we argued, and then we were like, why are we arguing about this? Let's just put this in front of people and see if what works. And the argument was solved. Like, people were telling us, I don't know where I am. And it's like, how could they not know where they are? We show them a picture of Mississippi. Alex said Mississippi. <laughs> this is absurd that they wouldn't know where in Mississippi, but they felt disoriented. We put the type on the screen, that problem went away. So trying to be, trying to sort of, especially as a boss, you know, being able to sort of stop yourself, stop thinking that you know all the, all the answers, and, and always trying to test these ideas with people. Um, very frequently throughout the project was something that I think helped us make it work. And how about you guys in Seattle? When or can you talk a little bit about the genesis of the project? You, uh, Danny, you made the joke yesterday that you two and uh, Genevieve, if she's in yeah. the audience, uh, that's your entire team, right? And you took on a very big project. So can you talk a little bit about how a you, you came up with the idea and the processes and, and really put it together uh, yeah. for a small small uh, team? Yeah. Well, I do want to um, certainly. We're not the entire team. I mean, it's, uh, especially. Uh, Craig Welch and uh, Steve Ringman, the reporter and photographer, and and of course the, it, w it really was a newsroom-wide project. But you know we are the two video editors on it, and Katrina really is the designer on it. Um, but when the project started, we actually had so this is something that Craig has been working on, and he's very very familiar with it, and probably one of the leading experts uh, on on ocean acidification. But when it came to us, we had very very little lead time on, on it. Um, we uh, we're lucky enough to get a grant from the Pulitzer uh, Foundation, the Pulitzer Center, and then the boat, uh, the scientists in Papua, Guinea, in Papua New Guinea were leaving in like two weeks. So everything had to come really together really quickly, and Craig had never done a video project before. So there were a lot of sessions in, our, in, our, in a little office with me and Genevieve saying, okay, 
So this is how you've always interviewed for print. Mm -hmm. These are the things that you'll have to do. And then uh, Steve is experienced as a, a video photographer and a stills photographer. And, and you're right that they're two very different gears. And so the way that Steve approaches stories is that he approaches them video first, knowing that if he has enough for a video story, that we'll, he will also, through that process, have enough photos for uh, a print story as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, we sort of just went in running. They learned how to dive incredibly quickly. Uh, Steve w was originally intending to approach us with a GoPro. And I was like, whoa! Like, I think that this is bigger than a GoPro. And so he's like, but we don't have any way of getting a camera underwater. So I was like, okay, well, give me the phone in some hours, you know? And, and so we really quickly put this together. He had underwater housing that I made him, like, I was like, just go out to the lake and dunk it, please, before you go to Papua New Guinea. Just dunk the thing in the water and dive with it one time before you go. But all the pieces had come out from Canada and everything, so that he really just received it almost, I mean, it was, it was like two days before he got oh. on the boat. Yeah. It was a lot more flying by the seat of our pants than this process sounds. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then editing is a much more deliberate process after that, but uh -huh. yes. Did, did you guys, um, and anyone jump in, did you guys have, uh, so Brian, you mentioned you, you, you tested it, but a tone and a voice to your pieces, uh, you know, they're, it feels different to me, and I, I know that's a bad description. When, when I watch these videos, it feels different than what I might see on TV or, or a lot of websites. Just the, the presentation, did you have a vision in your mind what the actual video would look and sound like? Well, it needed to sound like you. We definitely, yeah. we sort of, we, I think when we were looking at, I was thinking about things originally, I was thinking about, okay, there's no, there's no one hosting, no voiceover, no, and then we're like, no, that's stupid. We need, we, our, our voice is our strength. We gotta, all we gotta use Alex, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and the and one, of th one of the things I think that worked really well was with Kanaz and Josh, who's are two of our uh, sort of video editors, um, them coming up with you know really detailed shot lists, right? So that we knew, because so, we were sending people literally all over the world, and they weren't the same people, right? We had, we were sending one person to Colombia, one person to Bangladesh, mm -hmm. one person to Indonesia, or a group of people to Bangladesh, a group of people to Indonesia. Um, and so without that like really tight coordination, like for every person, like there's a scene at the end of it where there's just this sort of still shot of the person, it's like a po video portrait, they're just sort of sitting there. Um, and if we didn't have in the, in the list, I need a video portrait of every single person you meet, that thing wouldn't come together. Right. Right? And so they had, it, it was really pretty, pretty rigorous um, of the look and feel we were going for that we just sort of distributed to everyone and talked to everyone through. Right. And I think, I think, I mean, we had this enormous advantage in that we had a half a million dollars that we raised on the Kickstarter campaign of selling shirt. <laughs> like, that can't be overstated, uh, how much... Uh, what was your original would, wish? Uh, uh, 50. 50. We, we, were, we, were, we thought we'd get like 50 or 60, and then we ended up blowing through that because, the pe because it was, you know, and that was sort of the original idea of the project was, it was very captivating to us, and it turned out it was captivating to other people. So people really wanted that T-shirt that we were gonna make. And so they went on this Kickstarter, page and they, they purchased it, they basically pre-ordered the t-shirt we sold through Kickstarter. And a lot of people did it, a lot more people than we thought. So we ended up selling $590,000 worth of t-shirts for this project. And so, with which we were just, which we were gonna make this, this, this thing. So that, that, that really helps. And, uh, and so we knew we wanted it to be in a tone that was consistent with Planet Money, whatever the Planet Money tone is. But how that looks as in video, how, it, and we knew we wanted video, but how it, how it was going to look and how it was going to act, uh, you know, interactively on the on the web, we, we didn't really know. So that was a lot of trial and error. And in fact, we did. It 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 wasn't. We we didn't know how was it going to be one long video. Was it was it going to be video interspersed with text? And, you know, and in this sort of like this five sort of like five part format, where each thing was headed with a video and then it flowed into text. That, that was the result of a lot of trial and error and sort of like thinking and rethinking and going back to the whiteboard and trying to figure it all out. So just the architecture of the site, what, that it was gonna be a site <laughs> and that the site was gonna have architecture, uh, that, all, that, all, that all sort of evolved. Mm -hmm. how, about, how about you guys? How did you come up with your, your the look and feel presentation tone of the whole? Well, I'll start, so, so I, w I would say that what we had was intention and our intention with video was to engage and connect with the audience. 
And so once you know that that's your goal, you know, every cut can be made with intention, every sequence can be made with intention. And, and even when you're shaking through the transcripts and deciding you know, which characters stay and which characters leave and what quotes stay and what quotes leave, all of that comes with, with intention. But ours, you know, we, we rushed into that first shoot and then, um, and then as soon as everybody was back, we started really walking through and really understanding the science of it and starting trying to map out all of these uh, complicated concepts and how they all try to come together uh, into, into one piece that people could understand. Mm -hmm. After that happened, did you realize, was it one of those situations, this is what happened to us, especially early on in, in, our, in our sort of initial foray into television at This American Life, is that we'd, we'd think we were gonna do a story, we'd go out and we'd, do all the, we'd shoot all this stuff and then we'd come back and we'd learn actually what the story was and we realized that we didn't have anything to cover what our actual story was. Like we hadn't shot the right things, we hadn't taken pictures of the right stuff. Was that your, but it sounds like you guys but it, did that happen? Did you have to go out and reshoot stuff? Or, you know? Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah. like, like when we were going through it, we sort of found out that, you know, especially we, we were really uh, lucky to find scientists who could speak like people, you know, because I know that a lot, that, that's often a challenge for scientists. And that's also, you know, some of the role that journalism plays, of course, is to translate what's so important in science speak into, into the way that we speak. And so, um, but a lot of like, as for going back, some of this stuff was really, uh, one-shot deals like the scientists yeah. were going out to Papua New Guinea. They weren't going back, but there were um, some key characters that would be passing through Seattle, or, or we could approach again, or we could go up to Alaska and get. And and we did. We we went back to them over and over and over again, and and, and you know to make sure that we had enough material as we fleshed out the story. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it was just you know having. Uh, really good discussions before anybody went out because we we knew that on some of these on, on actually quite a few of these things it was really it was a one shot deal yeah and so it, it, where where we benefit is that you know it's one photographer through the project even uh, you know we would back him up on on some shoots but it was really his vision through a lot of it with our uh, coaching and input and, and and whenever he would come back from a trip. We would sit down, go over everything, and we did. We had these long, sprawling um, lists of, of all the shots that he had, and we started working on connecting it together, and we started trying to see what the story was. Yeah, there were huge challenges in him photographing and filming what an underwater story is. I mean, everything is either in the dark, underwater, or it's visible by microscope. And so, you know, Steve was able to, you know, miraculously capture a big story. I'm also leaving out that he was stuck on a fishing boat in Alaska for 10 days on one of the worst winter trips they've ever had. They ended up, I think, running out of fuel and dropping him off on an island where we had to <laughs> go find him and fly him back home. When, when planes couldn't touch down, he was stuck there for a while. Yeah. It, and you know, I, I also want to break out of the, the video player because this is not, video is a, is a part of the story, but it's not the story. You know, the story is the entire experience. And so I think that a lot of the like bigger discussions were, what is it, like what information do we need to have in the video and which can we rely on text or infographics living outside of it to do? And so like the more that we could get characters and emotion into the video portion, but export some of that, some of the more complicated science to, so that you had enough science where you could understand it, enough science that you could relate to it. But for the more complicated things, to, to, to use text as a much better tool for that. That was a lot of our discussions. Was there, along those lines, was there ever a concern um, with the user experience? Uh, for example, you know, maybe person X will only watch the video, so they'll miss this bunch, or may, you know, they might just listen to the audio. So how did you guys deal with that when you're putting together a multimedia project in the yeah. truest sense of the word? Our, I'm concerned that you bugged our newsroom. I know, our red <laughs> button, blue button issue was whether or not you could see part of the drop cap on the very first line of the story. <laughs> well, so, I, I mean, we had to address the concern because there were, I mean, we have a lot of very, very, very skilled storytellers in our newsroom who have been editing text, uh, you know, in closed offices for a really long time, for years. And so we had to have the discussion, and th this was a real discussion, what if someone only watches the video and never gets the story? I mean, that, that was the conversation that we had, so it was, a, it was an effort to redefine story. And I was like, well, you know, if that's our worst case scenario, if somebody takes eight, nine, 10 minutes of their life to learn all about a scientific issue and then maybe doesn't read any more, 
that's, that's a pretty good worst case scenario to live in. But I, I don't even think that that's the case. I really think, and I hope, uh, that the intention behind the video was to in help you engage even more with the rest of the project. But we definitely had those conversations and, and, and explaining that story is not text. And I'm curious if, if, if you know, how, how that relates to radio, but story is not text, the story is this entire experience. I mean, we, this was like the, I think we've all had the, as we try to figure out what actual multimedia on the you know, internet is, you know, we've all, I've had this experience and I think a lot of people have where you're sort of reading a story and then it's always sort of like, click here to hear more or click here to see more and like, it's always like, it's a little disjointed because I think people are in one of three modes, they're watching, they're reading, or they're listening and they're sort of separate modes and when you're in one mode you don't necessarily want to drop out of it and then go back into another mode. And I think that was part of the thing that guided us and then part of the thing was sort of like, yeah, like what you said, we, it's, this, this is, you know, this kind of storytelling is in, does not have a beginning, middle, or an end. And you can try to put, you know, you can try to like really guide people, like we really think you should start here, but then they're gonna do whatever they're gonna do. And like, so really all you control is the starting point and you have no idea how people are gonna follow it through. And so we sort of built in, but we did wanna sort of like build in this architecture. And so I think Brian and his team came up with a really innovative way of, of sort of guiding people through a multimedia experience, which I, I hadn't yeah. seen before. I mean, it's. You know, this sort of mode switching is a problem, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's something that we've been trying to sort out on, on our team since then. We've been doing, a, we've, we've now got the, we've got our photographers writing code, I'm learning to use a camera, like we're really working together now. <laughs> and, um, and, but on these pieces, how do you pull someone through a piece, right? How do you, how do you, you know, so, yeah, the switching from video to text, I mean, it's something that we did, but this piece was, there was a, there's a moment, um, so when these videos are all pretty short, the longest one's like seven minutes or something, and when each of the videos ends, it five seconds before it ends, we start scrolling the page for you. And so what we do is we're actually, we pour, sort of pull you down to the text section, and then at the end of the text section, there's sort of a big promo for, to click for the next video. So we're trying to, we're trying to like, uh, the, the metaphor, the metaphor I like, I don't know if there's any architecture geeks in the room, but if you've ever visited a, like a Frank Lloyd Wright house, right? Like, he does this thing where you're like in a room and you cannot resist walking into the next room because they're, it's not just like a series of boxes and doors. They're sort of boxes that sort of slightly overlap that like tease you. They give you a little bit of lag. So, and, 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 and you get, you just, you just, and he's like, he's like, he's like got, a, got a rope on you and he's sucking you through the house, right? So how do you design stuff on the internet like that? How do you get people to go from the text to the to the reading the graphics, to reading the text, to going back to the next video, and, and, and keep you through it. And, th and that's one of our, since then we've been remodeling a, a lot of our sort of, how do we measure the success of what we do? And as we've been looking at our analytics, I mean, completion rate and, uh, is something we measure really closely. So how far, did, how far did someone finish? Or we look at, so for each one of our pieces, we have like, we basically know each moment that each person left. So I can tell you like, like there's a piece we did, a follow-up piece called Borderland, where like the seventh chapter was a video and we lost half our audience. Like we were, it was a great photo text, people were flipping through, flipping through, flipping through, they loved it and hit the video, boom, they bailed. Um, so getting that right is yeah. hard. Yeah, and, and I think one of the, so one of the decisions was sort of like purely editorial, we had all these different things. What do we start with? What is the first thing you see? Do you see text? Do you see a big radio player? Do you see photograph, do you see video? What's the very first thing? And sort of once we figured that out, then there was a programming challenge of sort of like, okay, how are we gonna guide people through? We came up with that. But then we also had to sort of like let go the idea that people were, we could build our beautiful Frank Lloyd Wright house, but somebody's gonna go like, I need to use the bathroom going this way. <laughs> and, and if all you wanna do is watch video, what, is, what are the basics that we need every story to hit on? And then what are the things that video is gonna do way better than anything else? And what is the thing that audio is gonna do way better than anything else? And what is the thing that text is gonna do way better than anything else? And if like, if like as long as the basics are covered in each thing, then we wanna let it, we wanna let the thing that's doing it the best do it and not try to shoehorn some sort of like weird emotional moment that worked on, worked on audio but didn't work on video into the video story and vice versa. Yeah, that's why I feel like a lot of, sorry, a lot, a lot, a lot of TV video and a lot of sort of doc stuff, it's worth, it, it's what, the shit always gets awkward when, when they're doing something. They, they, either they, they don't tell part of the story, 
like like the, like on a radio story, we frequently dodge numbers, <laughs> right? Um, or or they try to tell it, and it just like it just it, it's where it fails, right? And so the you know the the fun thing about having all of these tools available to us is that we can use each one to their sort of optimal quality. Um, it also is it makes it impossible because you have to choose. We can kind of build anything. So having a process for figuring out what the right thing to build is, uh, that's, that's the difficult part. And I'd say that, you know, in, in addition to leading, using the design to lead everybody through all the different pieces of the story, that conversation of what chunk of information goes into each piece is really critical. And so I, I think that there's a tendency of, uh, when, when video is created, radio programs, when, when it's created for broadcast and then put online, there's this tendency to just repeat everything you just saw in the video and the text surrounding it. And so, I mean, that's great. You're offering people a choice to do an either, to, to, to do an or. It's an or choice. You can watch the video or you can read the text and you get really the same information. We want to make it an and choice so that you get, you know, you, you get the best parts in the video, you get the best parts in the text. And if you, if you, if you could go through the entire thing, then there's something more to the sum of those parts. I, I, I don't want anybody to watch the video and then suddenly start reading a transcript of it under I have one more question, and then we'll open up to some student questions because I, I think we're running out of time. Um, what, what, what advice do you guys have? You know, these this is called a spring prep day, so all these fine students are preparing for their spring semester, and uh, soon they'll be real journalists, right? So, what? Any advice? Right? Isn't that funny? Real journalists. Um, um, wh how? What should they be thinking of? You guys are in the real world. You're doing the best of the best, and they are going to get there someday. But what are some thoughts to have in their mind as they're, as they're thinking about the work they're doing now and, and the trajectory they might be going on the second they graduate? Any advice? Have fun. You know, uh, so everything that we create is for our audience, of course. But our first audience is ourselves. And I think that th we just have this tendency, at least, at least in my newsroom, to, to continue these stories that we know that we shouldn't, we're not interested in. You know, I, I think that there's a slog in, in newspaper work where we're doing these stories we're just not interested in. And when, when you sit down to do that, if you're not interested in your story, your audience isn't gonna be either. So, so at least have that test first. Have fun, enjoy what you're doing, and have it be interesting to you, number one. Yeah, I, that, that, that's the best advice I can imagine. It's sort of, you know, your, uh, yeah, I can't really put any better. <laughs> you go. I think he's going to say something smarter than me. So I'll go <laughs> <laughs> That's why I jumped in first. <laughs> um, you know, you'll probably be one of the younger people in your newsrooms. Don't let that scare you from challenging the status quo. When I started on this project, I was told from a pretty high level in the newsroom, like, this is not our snowfall, this is not our big project. And, you know, we really had to craft a vision as a team and kind of push at the potential of that and really challenge, like, is that true? Like, is this really not the story that we want to be our prime focus? And so, you know, don't don't let your youth and vigor hold you back in a newsroom. Yeah, just it, youth and vigor is like something that you sort of, now that mine is gone, <laughs> I realize how valuable it is and how a real, absolutely, unbelievably necessary asset it is in any organization and that like that's your key strength. You, you know, you, you guys don't know shit and that's fine. You're gonna learn it, you have your whole lives to learn it. But like what you have is you have energy and you have uh, passion and those are the things that sort of go away <laughs> as you get older. <laughs> and, and like, you know, we depend on the young people to sort of keep it fresh in ourselves, so yeah. Um, I guess I'd say two things. Um, practice. You know, I mean, it's it's like being a good basketball player. You practice; they, they practice every day, right? Like, this, this building fancy websites isn't rocket science. I have a computer science degree. This is not remotely as hard as I studied in college. Um, the but the but this this is stuff that you know. If you looked at any one of our any one of, any person on the team, if you looked at our sort of first first year or two's worth of projects, um, you you laugh at them, right? They're, they're, it, it, it takes work. And just doing things and making things and then making more things and um, so you know I guess don't 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 feel bad if that if that first web thing you make isn't like a thriller um, and just keep freaking making them um, the uh, and the other thing is I'd say always 
You know, there's, like I said earlier, that the, we, we, it's very easy to forget your audience, right? When you've got, when you've got that story, that perfect story in your head, like the, the, take that story, take that idea, sit back and say, okay, who actually cares about this? Okay, so I'm gonna write a story about schools. Who might care about this story? Is it, is it you know, who you're writing to? You're writing to administrators? Are you writing to parents? Are you writing to students? Are you writing to teachers? Right, and then okay, then you take pick two of those and set everyone else aside, and then talk about the needs of that specific group of people, right? But like this kind of exercise, I mean, it, it's sort of a D school design world kind of thing to do, but it works for writing, it works for good radio, it works for good fancy internet. Um, it just helps recenter you, you know, and and because uh, otherwise, who are you writing for? You writing for yourself? You writing for an award? All right, we keep it. We're going to take this DuPont, and I, I have a drawer that I keep our awards in. All right, and so we can like look at them every once in a while, and then we close the doors again because that's not what motivates us. Um, what motivates us is, is creating empathy, is, is 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 doing, is making our audience care about hard things. Um, so, any any questions from the crowd? We have a couple minutes. Yeah. Oh yeah, can you go to the microphone because this will be on camera. Sorry, production value. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you mentioned about uh, knowing your audience and the first question that <laughs> popped uh, in my mind was, who was your audience for the Makes a T-shirt? Because I really did like the, um, the writing in that. I heard the, the kind of radio-esque writing in that with the uh, twirling of the cotton and you know the long never-ending ponytail um, as well as the talking about cotton candy I thought that did like a really uh, good thing for it because I could as I was watching the images I could feel it almost and so I, I, I'm curious who was your audience there um, I, I mean I think you know I think our audience is always like just the sort of the, the, the uh, Sort of general listener who has the capacity to be interested in something that they wouldn't know they would be interested in, but is not necessarily the expert at all. Not, and, you know, far from the expert. So, so um, you know, a general, a general audience, you know, general listener. Was, I, I mean, I think it was serious. Like anybody who's ever worn a T-shirt and had any curiosity about the world, that was our audience. Um, and could I follow up with a question? Sure. Um, now, thinking about that, you know, uh, when you're trying to target a particular, a particular audience, but it's something controversial, such um, such as you know, like the the sea change, um, what what process do you have of considering capturing those who aren't interested and who, because they're not interested, the problem exists. So there's actually very little um, controversy around ocean acidification. You can debate climate change, but ocean acidification is really simple science. That carbon results in carbonic acid, it, it, it's a pretty simple, simple process. And so I, it wasn't as controversial. Our goal was just to make sure that we know um, when we're serving our Seattle audience who we serve first, um, we have an audience that's very interested in the environment um, everything, we, if you walk the streets of Seattle, you'll find on every drain, it's like, be careful what you put down here because this drains out to the south. You know, I mean, we're very environmentally conscious, but this was science that people weren't aware of. It wasn't being translated very well. And so our goal, one of our real goals on this, which is not our goal on every piece, but our goal on this was education, that we thought that um, people just needed to be able to, they needed to be able to, um, we needed to come up in a way that it was accessible to people, and we needed to explain it to them in terms that they could understand. Great, two more questions and then. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, so my reporting, no, not my reporting, my video professor and do, they're always like expressing how important it is to find really good characters for a piece, and you already had very like human faces to, I think, um, to cause that to me seemed very like either technical or scientific or industry driven. And I was just wondering how difficult it, it was or how crucial it was to find these characters before like starting a process and whether or not these characters are just as, just as important for an interactive piece as to like a documentary. 
Oh yeah, I mean that, that's the only like when we when we were, and I think there's two kinds of scenarios. There's one where like there's literally one character and it's the person that is doing the thing that you're profiling. If there's one person that we're doing something and you're doing a story about that person, like some scientists going on a boat, then you you got to make those people work. But in our case, we you know we had four million people in Bangladesh that we could sort of talk to about what it's like to work in a factory, and so we we use this word we audition our characters. We'll go and we'll, we'll, we'll spend a day just talking to as many different workers as we can. And visually, and that's why I, w I wanted separate people on visual and, and audio, because you're looking for very different things. For audio, you're looking for somebody who's a natural sort of storyteller, and there's certain people that, that just talk in stories and, and are very easy, you know, sort of expressive. Uh, and that's who you're looking for. You're looking for somebody who holds your attention sort of who you can hear. Um, and for video, you're looking for different things. You're looking for somebody with an expressive face, but maybe they're not the best storyteller, but they're, they don't have to say as much in video, but if they're communicating with their face, they're, they're, they're better. Um, or you look for somebody who is, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with video, I don't, you guys would have no better sense, but very much like we, the, 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 the workers that we profiled were the result of at least a day or maybe two days of going through and talking to probably dozens of people. Here's a quick toast to all of the wonderful people who gave us a lot of time and then never came off the editing floor. Mm -hmm. I mean, because so many people gave us a fair amount of time, and you know, a reporter, you know, identifies the people who I think speak well and are good characters. But s but from that group, not everybody makes it uh, into the final piece because it's it's about weaving um, all of these characters and all of the information that they have to say. Mm -hmm. Now that said, the other choice that we can make as um, video editors and as online producers is. You know, say if there's somebody who has something really great to say that's really um, additive to the, your overall understanding, but maybe isn't a character who can really be weaved through the entire piece, maybe that's a, a much smaller, shorter video that stands alone by itself, later on weaved into the story where it makes sense. And so not everything has to be in that main video or one of the main videos. Thank you. Last question? Hi, um, this is for Alex. Um, I think most of us think of uh, podcasting as sort of purely audio in terms of storytelling. Um, and you've just won uh, an award. You know, that's your game now, but you've just won an award for interactive and multimedia storytelling. So is there a future for this kind of storytelling um, for Gimlet Media or, or, for, or for podcasting companies? Well, uh, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't say no at all, like I think that there could be, I mean, mainly I say that because this, this project was such a thrill to work on, and it was something that was like, I just, I haven't really, it was like the whole time we were doing it, like, um, this woman who worked with Claire, what, what was she saying, this is, what was her catchphrase? Was, was, yeah, this project is fucking awesome, or something like that. Yeah. She was like, <laughs> over and over, every once in a while she would just like, just send it on the chat <laughs> function that we were using, and, uh, or whatever. Uh, so, um, and that's how I feel. So, I, so if, if there is ever a way for, for me to recreate that experience, I would, I would want to do it. Um, right now, I mean, starting a company is so different in so many ways, and right now all we, like, I just want to sort of like get the one thing that we're trying to do right <laughs> before I can sort of move on to other things. But yeah, I think absolutely, like in a year, um, maybe sooner we could, we, could, we could try to do something on this level. Great, thank you. So any parting words before we wrap up? It's been fantastic listening to you guys. Any, I know you've given some pearls of wisdom already, but go out and do it. I mean, <laughs> just do it and don't be afraid of failure. Like, like as a matter of fact, w even with, with, with Steve and Craig, we tried to send them out on short projects that they could uh, approach and fail on so they could learn from those and, and approach the, the actual project uh, better. But the, the cost of entry into video production is really low. It's all about your storytelling and your storytelling skills. So go out and use them and hone them and fail a few times. And, and just to add on to that, one of the very first things I ever, one of the first audio projects I ever did when I, you know, sort of I wanted a job at This American Life and I didn't get one yet and, and uh, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I learned a little bit about Pro Tools and how to tell an audio story. And a friend of mine, my best friend from college, was, was, having, was having a birthday. And so I just went around and interviewed all his friends about, you know, kept them to tell funny stories about him, and then I cut it together with like this American Life music, and I played it at his birthday party, and uh, and people really liked it, and it was really really gratifying to see that like, and it taught me a lot, uh, 
And like that project, it, nobody, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a journalism, but that project was really did like put me on the path that I was, that I was on. It was like that, it got, got me this sort of sense, like I got one under my belt, and then when I, I, I learned some things, I learned what I was doing, I learned that I could at least, that they were very, very good friends of mine, they were interested in what I was doing. But it was all stuff that was like, uh, it was, so even on that level, I mean, just doing it was really good advice. I'll go the big life advice route. <laughs> so we got a bunch of students in there. Um, um, like, I, I always, I feel like the most interesting shit is where, is these, these places where things meet, the transition points, or where groups of people meet, if it's, if it's funk music, or Creole food, or, a, you know, a, a, you know in, in fashion, and design, and like, try to place yourself at the edges of things, you know? Be the photographer that writes some code, or the graphic designer that, that shoots pictures, or the programmer who becomes a journalist. You know, like, th those, those are, there's a lot more fun there than, than at the middle of a field. And you can do a lot crazier shit. All right, that is the perfect way to end this. So I thank uh, Danny, <laughs> Katrina, Alex, and Brian. Great advice. Uh, thanks for coming. Congratulations on your award. Thanks.